this afternoon for this important lecture with today featuring the Honorable John O. Newman. We have been partners with the Jackson Center in Jamestown um, for 12 years now in terms of the delivery of this Jackson lecture. I ask you to help me thank the Jackson Center for uh, their uh, support and uh, their participation and partnership in providing uh, this lecture each year. <laughs> Judge Newman is going to be introduced by John Q. Barrett, who is a professor of law at St. John's University, where he teaches constitutional law, criminal procedure, and legal history. Professor Barrett has produced extensive scholarship on Justice Jackson, and he serves as the Elizabeth S. Linnae Fellow at the Robert H. Jackson Center. He is a graduate of Georgetown University and Harvard Law School. And without any further ado, as they say, I give you Professor John Barrett. Thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, good afternoon. Long time no see. It's always a pleasure to be back at Chautauqua. This was a, a quick interval since I had the privilege to lecture here a couple of weeks ago. My task this afternoon is a high honor and a high responsibility to be brief. So I will briefly address three topics. Robert Jackson, this lecture, and Judge John Newman. Robert Jackson, of course, was a native of this region, a lawyer in Jamestown, New York, a leader in the American legal profession, and then a New Deal presidential appointee who became the Attorney General of the United States, and a U.S. Supreme Court Justice. As if that weren't enough, he skipped away from the Supreme Court for a year and served as the Chief American Prosecutor of the Nazi war criminals in Nuremberg, Germany, during 1945-1946. But on top of all of that, I think it's fair to say, Robert Jackson was a Chautauquan. He never went to college. After a 13th year, a second senior year of high school, his path to the bar was mostly as an apprentice. So a lot of his higher learning was on these grounds and in the environment of this institution and this region and the speakers he heard and learned from, William Jennings Bryan, many others, and the opportunity to be a Chautauqua speaker. I want to focus for a second on July 4, 1947, 70 years ago. It was the last time Robert Jackson gave a major speech at Chautauqua in the amphitheater. And his topic was the fears of the impending World War III at that moment. Now, 70 years maybe isn't such a great distance. Robert Jackson, on that 4th of July, 70 years ago, spoke in very consoling, optimistic terms about American history and the potential, even in that deep moment of the Cold War, to have hope that diplomacy and leadership and communication would be a continuing path to peace. And he knew this somewhat directly because he had spent a year side by side and as a counterpart with Soviet colleagues at Nuremberg. And so Robert Jackson, with his brilliance, his judicial career, his service, and his accomplishments, was an enduring voice of hope at Chautauqua. Topic two, this lecture, I think is in that tradition. The Supreme Court of the United States, on which Jackson served with great distinction from 1941 until the fall of 1954, is an institution that takes, of course, a summer recess, a good job if you can get it. <laughs> and Chautauqua Institution takes summer action, if you will. And Jackson as a Chautauqua, the Supreme Court as a perpetually significant topic, the Chautauqua season as a summer moment to take stock of the Supreme Court was the genesis of this lecture which the Jackson Center has assisted Chautauqua Institution in hosting for the past 13 years. 
And this podium and these Jackson lectures on the Supreme Court have hosted a succession of great luminaries, profound thinkers, deeply experienced and engaged participation, participants in one way or another in the life and work of the Supreme Court, and voices who become an important part of the Chautauqua conversation. It's particularly a fit this summer, and was particularly a fun thing to plan because there was already a theme week in week five on the Supreme Court, and this lecture, in a sense, caps or continues or closes that. Which brings me to topic three, today's lecturer. Who is a capper or a topper or just an all-star? Judge John Newman, a native of Connecticut, uh, is a graduate of the Hotchkiss School and Princeton University and Yale Law School, and then served, because of his high academic achievements, as a law clerk to two very distinguished federal judges, Judge George Washington, yes, really, Judge George Washington, of the D.C. Circuit, uh, and then Chief Justice of the United States, Earl Warren, in 1957, 1958. Thereafter, John Newman uh, returned to Hartford and began law practice, but also quickly through democratic political activity, became an important aide and protege of governor, become cabinet secretary, become U.S. Senator Abraham Rivikoff. And the Rivikoff relationship, in time, was political support for the series of presidential appointments that has been John Newman's career path. Uh, private practice didn't last that long. He became the United States Attorney in Hartford, Connecticut. And then in 1971, he was appointed a United States District Court judge in the District of Connecticut, the Federal Trial Court. And after about six years as a trial judge, he was appointed to be a United States Court of Appeals judge for the Second Circuit, the Federal Court of Appeals, one rung below the U.S. Supreme Court, in the circuit that encompasses the three states of New York, Connecticut, and Vermont. An incredibly important jurisdiction, an incredibly weighty responsibility to decide the cases. And Judge Newman has been a judge of that U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals ever since. Uh, he served a term as the Chief Judge of the Court, and although today he is in, quote, senior status, he is still a very active, very important jurist contributing to the work of that court on a year-round basis, sometimes from New York and sometimes from Florida. Uh, John Newman is a giant of the federal judiciary. It's captured in a number of respects. One is a moment that didn't occur, but I think is fair to flag. In 1993, newly inaugurated President Clinton had a resignation by Justice White and an opportunity to appoint a Supreme Court Justice. And if one can believe the press reports, which in fact are true, <laughs> President Clinton quickly, after a number of interviews and consultations, uh, settled on a list of two finalists, Stephen Breyer and John Newman. And for personal circumstances, largely, uh, Judge Newman said, this isn't for me. And he took himself out of the running. Now, in the short term, that didn't help Judge Breyer, then the First Circuit, because President Clinton hadn't loved him on their first meeting. And so President Clinton then returned to someone who he also had not loved on their first meeting, then Judge Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> and he loved her a lot more the second time, and you know the story from there. And the next year, when President Clinton had a second vacancy, John Newman still had withdrawn from the running, and things worked out better for Stephen Breyer. But serving on the Supreme Court, wonderful gig, summer vacation, etc., that it is, is not the only measure of the greatest of our federal judges. Uh, one other tangible, objective honor that shows this is something called the Debit Award, which is an insider's honor in the legal profession. It's conferred on a kind of lifetime achievement, greatness basis to a member of the federal judiciary. It's really the Hall of Fame of the federal judiciary. And at the Supreme Court of the United States earlier this year, John Newman was awarded the Debit Award to honor his many decades of service to the federal judiciary, which are an ongoing contribution to what makes this country great and what makes one, I think, properly optimistic about this country's future. 
So it's a real pleasure to introduce the 13th Annual Chautauqua Institution Robert H. Jackson Lecturer on the Supreme Court of the United States, Judge John Newman. Perhaps the cert pool is an inevitable consequence 
of the huge increase in the number of cert petitions. In 57, there were just 18 law courts. Seven justices had two. Justice Douglas had one. Chief Justice had three. In 2014, each justice had four clerks for a total of 36. The reason Warren had three clerks in 57 was our primitive technology. There were no Xerox machines or other means for quickly reproducing copies of documents. And so when people without lawyers, called pro se's, asked the court to review their cases, they usually filed just one copy of a search petition, often handwritten. Most of these pro se's were prisoners, challenging either their conviction or the conditions of their confinement. With that one copy from the pro se, the law clerks for the Chief Justice prepared a short memo, usually two or three pages, for all nine justices of the court. We made copies of them by typing them on carbon sets with eight sheets of carbon paper between nine sheets of paper, tissue paper. Very primitive. Our memos were appropriately called flimsies. The ninth copy, it's fair to say, was barely legible. In 2014, the certain memos and pro se cases that were prepared by the certain tool. One day during my clerkship, Justice Frankfurter, who, as you may know, had a rather strained relationship with Chief Justice Warren, stopped me in the hallway on the way to my office and told me he wanted to come with me, he wanted me to come with him to his chambers to discuss one of those pro, pro se certain memos I had written. That is, he added with a twinkle in his eye, unless you're quarantined from my chambers. <laughs> On another occasion, when I had used a colloquial term in a memo, Justice Frankfurter wrote me a note, stating, quote, you have permitted the gaiety of conversation to intrude upon the permanence of print. <laughs> the increase in the number of clerks has had one consequence not usually reported. If you look at the thickness of the books containing opinions of the Supreme Court, you will notice that as the number of law clerks increased over the years, so did the number of pages of the court's opinions. There were not more opinions. In fact, there were fewer. The opinions just got longer. Law clerks draft many opinions, and justices often do not take the time to edit them down to an appropriate size. A few words about my title, Senior Law Clerk. In later years, I changed to Chief Clerk. The Chief Justice customarily bestowed the title on the one of his three clerks who had been a clerk at a Court of Appeals. Since I had been a clerk at the District of Columbia Court of Appeals, I got the title. It was not a merit designation. The title carried one perk, a large office all to myself, and the responsibility for choosing the monthly speakers for luncheons at the court with the entire group of law clerks. <laughs> Our drawing power was apparently significant. Dean Atchison came, Justice Brennan came, and then there was the time I invited a young senator from Massachusetts. The other clerks gave me a lot of grief for selecting John F. Kennedy in 1958, but I assured them this fellow had a big future. <laughs> In 1957, most of the small group of 18 clerks had lunch together almost every day in a room set aside for that purpose. Conversations covered lots of ground, and frequently one or more of us would urge the others to take a careful look at a certain petition that we thought was a strong candidate for Supreme Court review. The law clerks were first given a room for lunch during the 54 term after some justices overheard clerks talking about cases in the public cafeteria. The 2014 court on the other hand, had no lunchroom for the clerks, and today's clerks never have lunchroom to together as a full group, and rarely even in smaller groups. I think that changed the laws, not just in collegiality, but in opportunities for useful exchanges. A final fact about the clerks, seven of them have become justices of the court themselves, including this year's appointee, Neil Gorsuch, who was the first former clerk to serve alongside a justice for whom he clerk, Justice Kennedy. I turn now to the justices themselves. First, their number. There were nine in 1957 and nine in 2014. But the number has not always been nine. 
The first court, appointed by George Washington in 1789, had six justices. Congress increased the number to seven in 1807, to nine in 1837, to ten in 1863. Size was reduced to nine in 1866, to eight in 1868, and back to nine in 1869, where it has remained ever since. Although the number of justices is the same today as it was in 57, there has been a marked change in their backgrounds. In 1957, only two justices, John Harlan and Charles Whitaker, had previously served on a federal court of appeals. William Brennan had served on a state Supreme Court. And in 2005, and for the next five years, all non-justices had been judges on federal courts of appeals before their appointment. That pattern was not broken until 2010, when L.A. Kagan came to the court after serving as the United States Solicitor General. And for the 23 years from 1991 to 2014, there were always at least six justices who had been judges of federal court of appeals, eight in 2014 and eight today. I think the appointment of so many fed, former federal appellate judges is unfortunate. Although you would not expect me of all people to suggest that a federal court of appeals judge would not make an admirable <laughs> My point is that the court benefits from an array of justices with varied backgrounds, especially political experience. On the 57 court, two justices, Hugo Black and Harold Burton, had been U.S. Senators. Earl Warren had been a Governor. Tom Clark had been the U.S. Attorney General. William Douglas had been a Professor at the Yale Law School and Chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission. And Felix Frankfurter, had been a professor at the of Boston. <laughs> I should acknowledge that on the 2014 court, Justices Scalia, Ginsburg, Breyer, and Kagan had been full-time professors before their appointment, and some of the others who taught part-time. The 57 court comprised nine white men. Thurgood Marshall became the first black justice in 1967. Sandra Day O'Connor became the first Woman Justice in, 1990, in 1981. The court in 2014 included one black justice and three women. Three justices were Jewish and six were Catholic. In fact, a remarkable feature of the 2014 court is that no member of the court was a Protestant. A complete change from the court during most of the 19th century when all nine justices how the justices were confirmed has also significantly changed. We are now so used to televised hearings of nominees before the Senate Judiciary Committee that it is worth recalling the earlier practice. No nominee even attended the Syria Senate hearing until Harlan the Stone was briefly questioned in 1925. The next to attend was Justice Frankfurter, who showed up in 1939 but declined to answer any questions. <laughs> Questioning of a nominee resumed in 1955 when John Harlan, with John Harlan, an extensive grilling began in 1959 with the nomination of Potter Stewart. Of course, it was the hearing for Robert Borg in 1987 that significantly changed the hearing process, probably forever. The rejection of Borg, however, was not the first time the Senate failed to confirm a nominee for the court. Before war, rejection was more frequent than you might have thought. 36 nominations were not confirmed, although that represents 31 people because some were nominated again and six of those 31 were later confirmed. That leaves 25 people not confirmed. And the Senate's refusal to hold a hearing on President Obama's 2016 nominee, Merrick Garland, increased the number not confirmed to 26. The output of the court has significantly changed. As you may know, the court has discretion as to which cases it will accept for review, with rare exceptions such as appeals and reapportionment cases. That is quite different than the federal courts of appeals, like the one on which I serve. Anyone who loses in a federal trial court can take an appeal to a federal court of appeals, and we are required to hear every one of them. The Supreme Court, however, chooses which cases it will hear. 
As long as the case involves an issue of a federal law, such as an interpretation of the Constitution or some federal statute, the case is eligible for Supreme Court review. Issues of state law remain for decision by state courts. The number of cases the Supreme Court has asked to review has been steadily increasing over the years. The 57 court was asked to review nearly 1,400 cases and granted review in 110 cases. The 2014 court was asked to review more than 7,000 cases, but granted review in only 68 cases. Despite this five-fold increase in the number of requests for review, the output of the court has actually declined. The 57 court decided 117 cases with full opinions. The 2014 court decided only 76 cases with full opinion, about two-thirds as many as the 57 court. In between those years, the court's output hit a high of 167 in the 1981 term and has declined ever since. Although the number of cases decided has decreased, the length of the court's opinions has significantly increased. In the 50s, the median length of Supreme Court opinions was 2,000 words. In the 2009 term, the median length was more than 8,000 words. You're no doubt familiar with Parkinson's law. Work expands to fill the time available for its completion. Apparently, in the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court has a variation. Opinions expand to fill the time available to write. Which justice wrote the most opinions? Well, in the 57 term, counting majority, concurring, and dissenting opinions, Justice Harlan led with 35, closely followed by Justice Douglas with 34, Justice Frankfurter with 31, although 14 of the Douglas opinions were three pages or less. In the 2014 term, Justices Scalia, Thomas, and Sotomayor were tied with 28 opinions. As is well known by tradition, not rule, the votes of four justices are sufficient to grant a request for review. Even when four justices might vote to hear a case, they sometimes decline to do so because they anticipate that if the case is accepted for review, they will be outvoted five to four when the case is decided. The four might prefer to wait for a case presenting the same issue, but with stronger facts supporting their side of the issue. Or, if there is a vacancy on the court, the four might prefer to wait for the arrival of a fifth justice who might vote for their side of the issue when it arises in a similar case. Occasionally, if there are only three votes in favor of granting review, another justice will cast a so-called courtesy vote on the theory that if three colleagues feel strongly the case should be reviewed, that justice should supply for the vote. The courts in 57 and 2014 differ in a minor way with respect to the internal procedure for informing the staff about the disposition of certain petitions reached at the weekly conference of the justices. In 57, after each conference, the chief justice called the clerk of the court to his chambers and with the chief's personal clerks present, would announce which petitions had been granted and which did not. Sometime after 57, the junior justice was assigned the task of reporting certain petitions and denials to the clerk of the court. That earlier practice led to one bizarre occurrence during my clerkship. A prisoner named Harold Rogers, sentenced to death for murder, sought review of a decision limiting the authority of the district court to hear new evidence in a habeas corpus proceeding he had brought. He was claiming that his state court conviction violated his constitutional rights. I recommended to the chief justice that the court grant Rogers' petition, and he seemed inclined to do so. So when the chief justice reported the cert orders to the clerk of the court, he said, however, he said Rogers' petition had been denied. Soon as the clerk left, I reminded the chief justice this was a petition he favored granting. Oh, yes, he said, I think Felix suggested we just add some language to the denial order. Warren telephoned Frankfurt, wrote out the words Frankfurt wanted added, and silently showed them to me with the phone still at his ear. The words explained that the court understood the court of appeals to have ruled that the habeas corpus judge could generally accept the state court's findings. But the words said nothing about hearing new evidence. 
I thought the words were inadequate because Rogers wanted the federal judge to hear new evidence that his confession had been coerced. With just seconds to keep the case, and Rogers alive, I scribbled the added words, quote, and may take testimony. Warren read my words to Franklin, who for some reason I never understood or asked about, agreed to them. That is how an order was issued stating that certiorari had been denied because the Supreme Court understood the Court of Appeals to have said exactly the opposite of what it had really said. <laughs> The outcome provoked three law review articles commenting on the Supreme Court's aberrational procedure of reversing while denying certiorari. The case continued before an understandably perplexed district judge and later came back to the Supreme Court, which ruled on the merits that the confession had been coerced. Ultimately, the state permitted Rogers to avoid the death penalty, and he was eventually paroled. The two courts differ on when they filed their opinion. The 57th Court followed the earlier practice of filing all opinions only on a Monday. That practice changed in 65 when the court began to file opinions on two days a week, especially in the final weeks of the court's term. And the 2014 continued that practice. I can take some slight credit for that change. During my year as a clerk, the correspondent for the New York Times was Anthony Lewis, then the nation's best journalist covering the court. A tradition later continued for the Times by Linda Greenhouse and now by Adam Lipton. Tony Lewis and I discussed the problems created for the press by the court's habit of filing many important opinions in late in, July, in June, only on a Monday. I broached the matter to Chief Justice Warren, and he was receptive to adding opinion filing days and suggested the idea to the court. Justice Frankfurter was strongly opposed. Hearing of his opposition, I had the temerity to suggest to him that more than one opinion day a week would help the press explain the court's work to the public. He told me that was none of the court's business. <laughs> Soon after he died in 65, the court abandoned the Monday only filing of opinions. The court's communication with the public has significantly changed. Before 54, oral arguments were not recorded. During the 54 term, the future Chief Justice, Warren Burger, argued a case for the government in his capacity as Assistant Attorney General. A dispute arose as to whether he had made a concession during his argument. As a result of that controversy, Chief Justice Warren ordered all arguments to be recorded. However, for several years, those recordings were not available to the public. Only the justices and their law clerks could hear them. In later years, researchers could hear them at the National Archives, and still later, the court made recordings from one term available to the public at the beginning of the next term. Then, starting in 2010, the court made the recordings available to the public at the end of each argument week. And in 2013, recordings going back were digitized and those recordings were made available to the public online. And starting in 2006, trans transcripts of oral arguments have been released within hours of each other. The court's increased willingness to let the public hear the oral argument stands in sharp contrast to its adamant refusal to let the public see the arguments via television. The justices have advanced several reasons against televised arguments. Some of them have expressed concern about becoming more recognizable and increasing security risk. Others have said the public will get a distorted view of how the court functions, both because oral argument is only part of the process of presenting cases to the court, and because TV stations will air only snippets of an hour long argument. And concern has also been expressed that some justices would be tempted to grandstand for the public. I think none of these arguments has sufficient validity to outweigh the enormous public benefit of letting the public see oral arguments. I'm glad you agree. 
I agree there would be increased recognition, but many justices already show up frequently for televised arguments and interviews. And even without live television, their photos are flashed on the TV screen while a reporter recounts some of the more interesting experiences. It is likely that some news tasks lay our own standards, but the print media now inform the public of only small portions of arguments, and public understanding has not thereby suffered. And as for the risk of grandstanding, my guess is the TV cameras would have the opposite effect. Justices, I think, would be less inclined to provoke laughter, either at the expense of counsel or even their colleagues. In all 50 Supreme Courts of the country, state, oh, in all 50 state Supreme Courts, arguments are televised with no adverse consequences. The benefit would be significant. I would not predict high ratings for a typical Supreme Court argument, <laughs> but interested viewers would come to appreciate that the justices are engaged in a serious enterprise, the serious enterprise of probing to understand the lawyers' arguments and discussing the issues among themselves on the bench before private conference. C-SPAN would be expected to air raw arguments in full, at least in major cases, and even a chance to see excerpts would have a great educational effect. The conduct of oral arguments has changed since the 57 term. The court then allowed each side an hour for argument, except for cases placed on the so-called summary calendar, which each side got half an hour. By 2014, the court had changed its rules to allow a half hour for all cases. However, the court has allowed extended argument for a few major cases, for example, the case challenging the Affordable Care Act was argued for six hours over a three-day period. The modern practice stands in sharp contrast to the court's earlier decades, when there were no time limits on oral arguments, which sometimes lasted for several days. Lengthy written briefs were then unknown. More significant than the change in time for oral arguments is the change in the extent of the justices' participation a recent study meticulously counted and analyzed the number of words spoken by the justices and by lawyers in arguments before the 57 term, and I'm sorry, shortly after the 57 term, and shortly before the 2014 trial. The results are startling. In the early years arguments, counsel frequently began with long, uninterrupted statements, some running hundreds of words, and after a brief question or two, followed with more long, uninterrupted statements. In 61, the earlier years, one lawyer gave his entire argument for more than half an hour without interruption. But in the later years, the authors of the study report, quote, there were few cases in which counsel was able to say more than a sentence or two before being interrupted. The average in the earlier and the earlier years on average, the justices spoke for only one fourth as many words as counsel did. In the later years, justices spoke nearly two thirds as many words as counsel did. And in the more recent arguments, the justices frequently interrupt each other and ask several questions in a row before counsel could answer the first one. During the 57 and 2014 courts, both, I'm sorry, both the 57 and 14 courts continued the practice of filing all the terms' opinions in argued cases before the end of the court adjourns for the summer. On the last day, the Chief Justice states, quote, all cases submitted to the court for decision, which are ready for disposition, have been acted upon by the court, or a variation of that phrase. That phrase, ready for disposition, obscures an interesting maneuver. If the court is not ready at the end of the term to file a major opinion in a case that has been argued, the case is set for re-argument at the beginning of the next term, in October, and an order is entered. That rarely happens, but occurred at least once to very good effect. In June 1953, the court was not ready to file opinions in the historic school desegregation cases. At that time, the court was divided on the outcome. It has been widely reported, based on the justices' papers, that Justice Frankfurter urged re-argument for the specific purpose 
of gaining support for the eventual ruling. The court ordered re-argument and asked for a briefing on five detailed questions. The delay had a significant consequence that affected the outcome. During the summer, Chief Justice Vinson, who had not, was not prepared to rule that segregated schools unconstitutional, died. After re-argument in December, the new Chief Justice, Earl Warren, persuaded the recalcitrant justices to reject the separate but equal doctrine, and he then wrote the historic opinion in Brown v. Board of Education, which was filed in May of 1954. The decision would not have been unanimous had the case been decided in June of 1953. The court's normal practice of filing all opinions before the Rummer and Summer recess has one unfortunate consequence. In the rush to file all opinions before the term ends, the court occasionally permits some ill-advised language to remain in majority opinions. All 13 federal courts of appeals file opinions during the summer months, and I believe all the state courts do that too. I suppose there's some slight virtue in assuring the justices of three months restful summer, so they can come here, for example. Um, but I think a slight interruption of three month vacation would be tolerable. With modern technology, the justices could easily exchange views for finalizing opinions without reassembling in Washington. Indeed, the court on rare occasions has reconvened during the summer recess to hear and quickly resolve emergency matters. There are two well known examples. On June 15, 1953, after announcing a recess, the court considered the application filed by Julius and Ethel Rosenberg to obtain a last minute with the Patriots Corpus to avoid execution, and the court denied it the same day. On June 24, 1971, the court heard argument in the Pentagon Papers case, and four days later, permitted their publication. The membership of the 1957 court bears a striking resemblance to the membership of the 2014 court. Both courts had a four-member liberal wing, a four-member conservative wing, and one justice in the middle. The liberals in 57 were Warren, Black, Douglas, and Brennan. The conservatives were Franklin, Burton, Clark, and Ronald. The man often in the middle was Charles Woodrow. I need not remind this knowledgeable audience of the name of the four liberals, the four conservatives, and often the swing voter in 2014. The name begins with K, and it's not K. I do not mean to leave the impression that either court routinely divided along liberal and conservative lines. They did not. Indeed, of the 117 opinions of the 57 court, 28 were unanimous. And of the 76 opinions in the 2014 court, again, 28 were unanimous. But both courts issued a number of 5 4 decisions, 20 in 57, 19 in 2014. And when both courts divided 5 4, the liberal and conservative blocks were often intact, but not always. Some unusual voting alignments occasionally occurred. In the 57 term, the members of the 5 member majority affirming one conviction were Warren, Black, Clark, Burton, and Whitaker. In 2014, the members of two five member majorities were Roberts, Alito, Ginsburg, Breyer, and so on. But in most important cases, the blocks were usually intact, and the swing voter determined the outcome. Two five four decisions of the 57 term raised the most fundamental issues considered that term. They both concerned the power of Congress to denationalize a person, that is, to take citizenship away from a native born citizen. The cases were Perez v. Brownell and Folk v. Dulles. In surprising outcomes, the court voted 5 to 4 in Perez to uphold their law, removing citizenship from a native born citizen for voting in a foreign election. And on the very same day, voted 5 to 4 in Trove to declare unconstitutional a law imposing loss of citizenship as a punishment for wartime desertion. 
In Perez, the court upheld denationalization as a reasonable exercise of Congress's implied power to regulate the nation's foreign affairs. But in Trope, the court invalidated denationalization, ruling it a cruel and unusual punishment in violation of the Eighth Amendment. In these two 5-4 decisions, Justice Brennan voted for both results. Outcomes he acknowledged were, quote, paradoxical. But in many 5-4 cases, 57, Justice Whitaker cast the key vote. Unlike the able Justice Kennedy, whose vote was often decisive in many of the 5-4 decisions of 2014, Whitaker was a jurist of modest accomplishments. <laughs> He found the task overwhelming. When some of us told a Whitaker clerk one day that their justice would be nervous, the clerk said, you'd be nervous too if you were deciding every case in this building. <laughs> the most interesting aspect of the 57 swing voters was the way his vote was sought by the two blocks. No fair damsel was ever courted more secrecy. <laughs> it was embarrassing. My favorite recollection concerned a particularly difficult case, Harmon against Brooker. The question was whether the military could give a soldier a less than honorable discharge for misconduct occurring before he joined the armed services. It was the court's practice to vote at a Friday conference on cases argued the previous four years. At the first conference after Harmon was argued, no votes were cast. The case remained undecided at the next two conferences. With no justice voting even at the fourth conference, Justice Whitaker stunned his brethren at the conference by saying, Chief, how about I try my hand at a draft? Eight hypocritical voices having no idea what Whitaker had in mind chorus, Charlie, that's a great idea. <laughs> a few weeks later, Whitaker circulated a draft opinion. It was just awful. <laughs> poorly reasoned and poorly written. What the hell is this, we asked the Whitaker clerks. Their reply, we're seeing it for the first time just as you are. For several days, no justice said or wrote anything. They were all determined not to offend the object of their affection. <laughs> Finally, Justice Frankfurter acted, and he did so in an astonishing way. He took Whitaker's draft opinion to the print shop in the Supreme Court building and had the opinion reset with triple spacing. Then Frankfurter applied his pen to the Whitaker draft and, in the manner of a schoolteacher, crossed out all the wrong words and inserted words that made sense. Frankfurter circulated the revision to the entire world. I could not believe he was so humiliated under justice, but I was sure he was clueless about how his handiwork would be perceived by Whitaker and by the other justices. It was a failing of the brilliant Frankfurter that he could be so unintentionally tactless. The case was ultimately decided in an unsigned opinion ruling that the discharge was invalid. As far as I'm aware, the two blocks of the 2014 court engaged in no similar courtship of Justice Kennedy. Indeed, the late Justice Scalia took just the opposite tack, going out of his way to use hostile language that was certain to drive Kennedy away. In his dissent in the same-sex marriage case, Justice Scalia famously wrote, quote, if I ever joined an opinion for the court that began, and here he quoted the first sentence from Justice Kennedy's opinion, Scalia continued, I would hide my head in a bag. <laughs> Scalia managed to insult both Kennedy and the four justices who had joined Kennedy's opinion. Chief Justice Warren's plurality opinion in the Trope case provides the basis for comparing the 57 and 24 courts in two respects. The first stems from the well-known sentence in his Trope opinion defining the Eighth Amendment, a sentence frequently quoted in whole or in part many years in many Supreme Court majority opinions. One as recently as March of this year. Warren wrote, quote, 
The amendment, the amendment was draw its meaning from the evolving standards of decency that mark the progress of a maturing society. That sentence from the 57 term, declaring that the meaning of cruel and unusual was not limited to the original meaning in 1787, prompted an extraordinary report from Justice Scalia in the 2014 term. In his dissenting opinion in Glossop Gross, Scalia said the Trope case, quote, has caused more mischief to our jurisprudence, to our federal system, and to our society than any other that comes to mind. Warren's opinion in Trope and Scalia's opinion in Glossop exemplify the fundamental divide between those who view the Constitution in some respects as a living document, adaptable to new conditions, and the so-called originalist view that the Constitution means today exactly what it meant in 1787 when it was adopted. I say the so-called originalist view because no originalist really believes that every clause of the Constitution means today exactly what it meant then. Of course a person still has to be 35 to be eligible to become president, and every state still has just two senators. But even Justice Scalia agreed that the 14th Amendment should not be understood in the 20th century to perpetuate the separate but equal doctrine of the 19th century. Another example, the Fourth Amendment prohibiting unreasonable search and seizure originally meant that only searches conducted pursuant to a general warrant were prohibited. But Justice Scalia agreed with the modern court that unreasonable searches now means any search where the state's legitimate law enforcement needs do not outweigh the individual's reasonable expectation of privacy. And it is fair to ask, was Scalia warranted in the scorn he directed to Warren's view that the cruel and unusual cause evolves as society's views mature? If, as Scalia claimed, the only punishments that are cruel under the Eighth Amendment are those that were cruel in 1787, why did he think the arms that people are entitled to bear under the Sixth and Second Amendment are not limited to muskets? <laughs> Some clauses retain their original meaning, some do not. Reasonable jurists can differ as to which are which. In fact, there was little of any talk in 1957 about originalism. Those clear, critical of the Warren Court's liberal decisions usually argued the court was not observing appropriate judicial restraint. Warren's stroke opinion also reveals another difference between the court's view in the 57 court and Justice Scalia's view in the 2014 term. Warren surveyed the law of the nations of the world, then number 84, and his opinion reported that only two used taking away citizenship as a punishment for desertion. Decades later, Scalia would argue vehemently that it is improper even to cite foreign law in interpreting our Constitution. What is noteworthy about Warren's reference to foreign law and trope is that not even the four dissenting justices at that time expressed the slightest concern that he had done so, nor did any contemporaneous commentary. Indeed, in a 2005 opinion, Roper v. Simmons, ruling that the death penalty could not be imposed on those under the age of 18 at the time of their crime, Justice Kennedy pointed out that almost all the other nations took the same position. And Kennedy cited Warren's reference to foreign law and trope. Of course, in his dissent of Roper, Justice Scalia said the invocation of foreign law, quote, should be rejected out of hand. My final comparison of the Supreme Court then and now takes me back a few years before the 57 term to 1952, when the court decided the Steel Seeker case. That case is often recalled because of Justice Jackson's well-known concurring opinion, which the court discussed in the 2014 Zivotofsky case. The steel seizure case, many will recall, was a challenge to President Truman's seizure of the steel mills on the eve of the nationwide strike. The case presented a major confrontation between the executive and legislative branches. 
In his concurring opinion, Justice Jackson divided presidential power into three categories. In the first, the president acts pursuant to the authority of Congress. In that situation, said Jackson, the president's power is at its maximum. In the second category, the president acts in the absence of any statute that either authorizes or prohibits his action. In that situation, said Jackson, the president must rely on his own independent powers. But he added, there is a zone of twilight in which he and Congress may have concurrent authority. In the third category, the president acts contrary to the will of Congress. In that situation, said Jackson, presidential power is, quote, at its lowest ebb. And he can rely, quote, only upon his own constitutional powers, minus any constitutional powers of Congress over the matter. To succeed in the third category, Jackson added, the president's power must be both exclusive and conclusive on the matter. In the Steele seizure case, Jackson, agreeing with the court's unanimous decision, said President Truman's seizure of the Steele mills was in the third category because it was in violation of an implied prohibition of Congress and unlawful because it was beyond any exclusive power of the president. The 2014 case, Zivotofsky, if I'm pronouncing it right, also presented a conflict between the executive and legislative branches. Menachem Zivotofsky was born in Jerusalem. His mother asked the U.S. Embassy to list Israel as her son's place of birth on his U.S. passport. The American Embassy refused, relying on a State Department policy statement that while the place of birth of a United States citizen born abroad could normally be recorded as the country having sovereignty over the city of birth, Menachem's birthplace would be recorded as Jerusalem, not Israel, because the United States did not recognize any country as having sovereignty over that city. However, in the 2002 statute, Congress included a provision that sought to overturn the State Department policy and permit the place of births like monuments to be listed on a passport as Israel. The mother sued, invoking the Congressional Act. A divided Supreme Court ruled the statutory provision unconstitutional because it was an impermissible encroachment on the exclusive power of the president to recognize foreign states and their territorial boundaries. In reaching that decision, the court invoked Justice Jackson's concurring opinion in the Steel Seizure case. In Zivotofsky, as in the Steel Seizure case, the court placed the president's action in Jackson's third category because the president had again acted contrary to the will of Congress. But this time, the court upheld the president's power. It ruled the action was within the president's exclusive recognition power, and the act of Congress was therefore unconstitutional. Jackson's much cited categories in the street, three categories in the steel seizure, provide a useful framework for beginning analysis of presidential power. But I doubt that they get us very far. All cases in the first category where the president acts in accordance with an act of Congress are clear. Most cases will be of the second category. And Jackson told us nothing about the standards he would use for testing presidential action when Congress has neither authorized nor prohibited such action. Jackson's third category, where Congress directly or impliedly prohibits presidential action, also provides little basis for determining outcomes, as the opposite results in Steele's seizure and Zivotofsky, both in the third category, illustrate. If you will permit me to express a minor heresy, I think Jackson's three-category analysis reveals somewhat less than meets the eye. I am much more enthusiastic about his frequently quoted judicial, most frequently quoted judicial sentence. In Brown v. Allen, he wrote the best aphorism ever applied to the Supreme Court. Quote, we are not final because we are infallible, but we are infallible because we are final. <laughs> so well 
question. It's so true. I close by recalling one of my favorite passages in all of rhetoric, Jackson's open statement for the prosecution that November. I urge you to read it either for the first time or again. Here is the last sentence of the first paragraph. That four great nations, flushed with victory and stung with injury, stay the hand of vengeance and voluntarily submit their captive enemies to the judgment of the law is one of the most significant tributes that power has ever paid to reason. That seems like a good note on which to end the Robert H. Jackson.